This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the North American Review, September 21, 1906. Chapters from My Autobiography by Mark Twain. Chapter 2. My experiences as an author began early in 1867. I came to New York from San Francisco in the first month of that year, and presently Charles H. Webb, whom I had known in San Francisco as a reporter on the Bulletin, and afterward editor of the Californian, suggested that I publish a volume of sketches. I had but a slender reputation to publish it on, but I was charmed and excited by the suggestion, and quite willing to venture it if some industrious person would save me the trouble of gathering the sketches together. I was loath to do it myself, for from the beginning of my sojourn in this world there was a persistent vacancy in me where the industry ought to be. Ought to was is better, perhaps, though the most of the authorities differ as to this. Webb said I had some reputation in the Atlantic States, but I knew quite well that it must be of a very attenuated sort. What there was of it rested upon the story of the jumping frog. When Artemus Ward passed through California on a lecturing tour in 1865 or 66, I told him the jumping frog story in San Francisco, and he asked me to write it out and send it to his publisher, Carleton, in New York, to be used in padding out a small book which Artemus had prepared for the press, and which needed some more stuffing to make it big enough for the price which was to be charged for it. It reached Carleton in time, but he didn't think much of it, and was not willing to go to the typesetting expense of adding it to the book. He did not put it in the waste-basket, but made Henry Clapp a present of it, and Clapp used it to help out the funeral of his dying literary journal, The Saturday Press. The jumping frog appeared in the last number of that paper, was the most joyous feature of the obsequies, and was at once copied in the newspapers of America and England. It certainly had a wide celebrity, and it still had it at the time that I am speaking of, but I was aware that it was only the frog that was celebrated. It wasn't I. I was still an obscurity. Webb undertook to collate the sketches. He performed this office, then handed the result to me, and I went to Carleton's establishment with it. I approached a clerk, and he bent eagerly over the counter to inquire into my needs. But when he found that I had come to sell a book and not to buy one, his temperature fell sixty degrees, and the old gold entrenchments in the roof of my mouth contracted three-quarters of an inch, and my teeth fell out. I meekly asked the privilege of a word with Mr. Carleton, and was coldly informed that he was in his private office. Discouragements and difficulties followed, but after a while I got by the frontier and entered the Holy of Holies. Ah, now I remember how I managed it. Webb had made an appointment for me with Carleton. Otherwise I never would have gotten over that frontier. Carleton rose and said brusquely and aggressively, "'Well, what can I do for you?' I reminded him that I was there by appointment to offer him my book for publication. He began to swell, and went on swelling, and swelling and swelling, until he had reached the dimensions of a god of about the second or third degree. Then the fountains of his great deep were broken up, and for two or three minutes I couldn't see him for the rain. It was words, only words, but they fell so densely that they darkened the atmosphere. Finally he made an imposing sweep with his right hand, which comprehended the whole room, and said, "'Books! Look at those shelves! Every one of them is loaded with books that are waiting for publication. Do I want any more? Excuse me, I don't. Good morning.' Twenty-one years elapsed before I saw Carleton again. I was then sojourning with my family at the Schweitzerhof in Luzerne. He called on me, shook hands cordially, and said at once, without any preliminaries, I am substantially an obscure person, but I have at least one distinction to my credit of such colossal dimensions that it entitles me to immortality. To wit, I refused a book of yours, and for this I stand without competitor as the prize ass of the nineteenth century. It was a most handsome apology, and I told him so, and said it was a long-delayed revenge, but was sweeter to me than any other that could be devised. 
that during the lapsed twenty-one years I had in fancy taken his life several times every year, and always in new and increasingly cruel and inhuman ways, but that now I was pacified, appeased, happy, even jubilant, and that thenceforth I should hold him my true and valued friend, and never kill him again. I reported my adventure to Webb, and he bravely said that not all the Carltons in the universe should defeat that book. He would publish it himself on a ten per cent royalty, and so he did. He brought it out in blue and gold, and made a very pretty little book of it. I think he named it The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County and Other Sketches. Price one dollar twenty five cents. He made the plates and printed and bound the book through a job printing house and published it through the American News Company. In June I sailed in the Quaker City excursion. I returned in November, and in Washington found a letter from Elisha Bliss of the American Publishing Company of Hartford, offering me five per cent royalty on a book which should recount the adventures of the excursion. In lieu of the royalty, I was offered the alternative of ten thousand dollars cash upon delivery of the manuscript. I consulted A. D. Richardson, and he said, Take the royalty. I followed his advice and closed with Bliss. By my contract, I was to deliver the manuscript in July of 1868. I wrote the book in San Francisco and delivered the manuscript within contract time. Bliss provided a multitude of illustrations for the book and then stopped work on it. The contract date for the issue went by, and there was no explanation of this. Time drifted along, and still there was no explanation. I was lecturing all over the country, and about thirty times a day, on an average, I was trying to answer this conundrum. When is your book coming out? I got tired of inventing new answers to that question, and by and by I got horribly tired of the question itself. Whoever asked it became my enemy at once, and I was usually almost eager to make that appear. As soon as I was free of the lecture field, I hastened to Hartford to make inquiries. Bliss said that the fault was not his, that he wanted to publish the book, but the directors of his company were staid old fossils and were afraid of it. They had examined the book, and the majority of them were of the opinion that there were places in it of a humorous character. Bliss said the house had never published a book that had a suspicion like that attaching to it, and that the directors were afraid that a departure of this kind would seriously injure the house's reputation, that he was tied hand and foot, and was not permitted to carry out his contract. One of the directors, a Mr. Drake, at least he was the remains of what had once been a Mr. Drake, invited me to take a ride with him in his buggy, and I went along. He was a pathetic old relic, and his ways and his talk were also pathetic. He had a delicate purpose in view, and it took him some time to hearten himself sufficiently to carry it out, but at last he accomplished it. He explained the house's difficulty and distress, as Bliss had already explained it. Then he frankly threw himself and the house upon my mercy, and begged me to take away the innocents abroad and release the concern from the contract. I said I wouldn't, and so ended the interview and the buggy excursion. Then I warned Bliss that he must get to work, or I should make trouble. He acted upon the warning, and set up the book, and I read the proofs. Then there was another long wait, and no explanation. At last, towards the end of July, 1869, I think, I lost patience and telegraphed Bliss that if the book was not on sale in twenty-four hours I should bring suit for damages. That ended the trouble. Half a dozen copies were bound and placed on sale within the required time. Then the canvassing began and went briskly forward. In nine months the book took the publishing house out of debt, advanced its stock from twenty-five to two hundred, and left seventy thousand dollars profit to the good. It was Bliss that told me this, but if it was true, it was the first time that he had told the truth in sixty-five years. He was born in 1804. Number 3. This was in 1849. I was fourteen years old then. We were still living in Hannibal, Missouri, on the banks of the Mississippi, in the new frame house built by my father five years before. That is, some of us lived in the new part, the rest in the old part, back of it, the L. 
In the autumn my sister gave a party, and invited all the marriageable young people of the village. I was too young for this society, and was too bashful to mingle with young ladies anyway, therefore I was not invited, at least not for the whole evening. Ten minutes of it was to be my whole share. I was to do the part of a bear in a small fairy play. I was to be disguised all over in a close-fitting brown hairy stuff proper for a bear. About half-past ten I was told to go to my room and put on this disguise, and be ready in half an hour. I started, but changed my mind, for I wanted to practice a little, and that room was very small. I crossed over to the large unoccupied house on the corner of Main and Hill Streets, that house still stands, unaware that a dozen of the young people were also going there to dress for their parts. I took the little black slave boy, Sandy, with me, and we selected a roomy and empty chamber on the second floor. We entered it talking, and this gave a couple of half-dressed young ladies an opportunity to take refuge behind a screen undiscovered. Their gowns and things were hanging on hooks behind the door, but I did not see them. It was Sandy that shut the door, but all his heart was in the theatricals, and he was as unlikely to notice them as I was myself. That was a rickety screen with many holes in it, but as I did not know there were girls behind it, I was not disturbed by that detail. If I had known, I could not have undressed in the flood of cruel moonlight that was pouring in at the curtainless windows. I should have died of shame. Untroubled by apprehensions, I stripped to the skin and began my practice. I was full of ambition. I was determined to make a hit. I was burning to establish a reputation as a bear and get further engagements. So I threw myself into my work with an abandon that promised great things. I capered back and forth from one end of the room to the other, on all fours, Sandy applauding with enthusiasm. I walked upright and growled and snapped and snarled. I stood on my head. I flung handsprings. I danced a lubberly dance with my paws bent and my imaginary snout sniffing from side to side. I did everything a bear could do, and many things which no bear could ever do, and no bear with any dignity would want to do, anyway. And, of course, I never suspected that I was making a spectacle of myself to any one but Sandy. At last, standing on my head, I paused in that attitude to take a minute's rest. There was a moment's silence. Then Sandy spoke up with excited interest and said, "'Mar Sam, has you ever seen a smoked herring?' "'No. What is that?' "'It's a fish.' "'Well, what of it? Anything peculiar about it?' "'Yes, sir, you bet you day is. Day eats em, guts and all!' There was a smothered burst of feminine snickers from behind the screen. All the strength went out of me, and I toppled forward like an undermined tower, and brought the screen down with my weight, burying the young ladies under it. In their fright they discharged a couple of piercing screams, and possibly others, but I did not wait to count. I snatched my clothes and fled to the dark hall below, Sandy following. I was dressed in half a minute and out the back way. I swore Sandy to eternal silence, and then we went away and hid until the party was over. The ambition was all out of me. I could not have faced that giddy company after my adventure, for there would be two performers there who knew my secret, and would be privately laughing at me all the time. I was searched for, but not found, and the bear had to be played by a young gentleman in his civilized clothes. The house was still and everybody asleep when I finally ventured home. I was very heavy-hearted and full of a sense of disgrace. Pinned to my pillow I found a slip of paper which bore a line that did not lighten my heart but only made my face burn. It was written in a laboriously disguised hand, and these were its mocking terms. You probably couldn't have played bear, but you played bear very well. Oh, very well. We think boys are rude, unsensitive animals, but it is not so in all cases. Each boy has one or two sensitive spots, and if you can find out where they are located, you have only to touch them, and you can scorch him as if with fire. I suffered miserably over that episode. I expected that the facts would be all over the village in the morning, but it was not so. The secret remained confined to the two girls and Sandy and me. That was some appeasement of my pain, but it was far from sufficient. The main trouble remained. I was under four mocking eyes, and it might as well have been a thousand, 
for I suspected all girls' eyes of being the ones I so dreaded. During several weeks I could not look any young lady in the face. I dropped my eyes in confusion when any one of them smiled upon me and gave me greeting, and I said to myself, That is one of them, and got quickly away. Of course I was meeting the right girls everywhere, but if they ever let slip any betraying sign I was not bright enough to catch it. When I left Hannibal four years later the secret was still a secret. I had never guessed those girls out, and was no longer expecting to do it, nor waiting to, either. One of the dearest and prettiest girls in the village at the time of my mishap was one whom I will call Mary Wilson, because that was not her name. She was twenty years old. She was dainty and sweet, peach-bloomy and exquisite, gracious and lovely in character, and I stood in awe of her, for she seemed to me to be made out of angel clay and rightfully unapproachable by any unholy ordinary kind of boy like me. I probably never suspected her. But the scene changes. To Calcutta, forty-seven years later. It was in 1896. I arrived there on my lecturing trip. As I entered the hotel a divine vision passed out of it, clothed in the glory of the Indian sunshine, the Mary Wilson of my long-vanished boyhood. It was a startling thing. Before I could recover from the bewildering shock and speak to her, she was gone. I thought maybe I had seen an apparition, but it was not so. She was flesh. She was the granddaughter of the other Mary, the original Mary. That Mary, now a widow, was upstairs, and presently sent for me. She was old and gray-haired, but she looked young and was very handsome. We sat down and talked. We steeped our thirsty souls in the reviving wine of the past, the beautiful past, the dear and lamented past. We uttered the names that had been silent upon our lips for fifty years, and it was as if they were made of music. With reverent hands we unburied our dead the mates of our youth, and caressed them with our speech. We searched the dusty chambers of our memories, and dragged forth incident after incident, episode after episode, folly after folly, and laughed such good laughs over them, with the tears running down. And finally Mary suddenly, and without any leading up, "'Tell me, what is the special peculiarity of smoked herrings?' It seemed a strange question at such a hallowed time as this, and so inconsequential, too. I was a little shocked. And yet I was aware of a stir of some kind away back in the deeps of my memory somewhere. It set me to musing, thinking, searching. Smoked herrings! Smoked herrings! The peculiarity of smoke. <sighs> I glanced up. Her face was grave, but there was a dim and shadowy twinkle in her eye which, all of a sudden, I knew. And far away down in the hoary past I heard a remembered voice murmur, "'Day eats em, guts and all.' "'At last! I've found one of you, anyway. Who was the other girl?' But she drew the line there. She wouldn't tell me. Number 4 but it was on a bench in Washington Square that I saw the most of Louis Stevenson. It was an outing that lasted an hour or more, and was very pleasant and sociable. I had come with him from his house, where I had been paying my respects to his family. His business in the square was to absorb the sunshine. He was most scantily furnished with flesh. His clothes seemed to fall into hollows, as if there might be nothing inside but the frame for a sculptor's statue. His long face and lank hair and dark complexion and musing and melancholy expression seemed to fit these details justly and harmoniously, and the altogether of it seemed especially planned to gather the rays of your observation and focalize them upon Stevenson's special distinction and commanding feature, his splendid eyes. They burned with a smoldering rich fire under the penthouse of his brows, and they made him beautiful. I said I thought he was right about the others, but mistaken as to Bret Hart. In substance I said that Hart was good company, and a thin but pleasant talker, that he was always bright, but never brilliant, that in this matter he must not be classed with Thomas Bailey Aldrich, nor must any other man, ancient or modern, that Aldrich was always witty, always brilliant, if there was anybody present capable of striking his flint at the right angle 
that Aldrich was as sure and prompt and unfailing as the red-hot iron on the blacksmith's anvil. You had only to hit it competently to make it deliver an explosion of sparks. I added, Aldrich has never had his peer for prompt and pithy and witty and humorous sayings. None has equaled him, certainly none has surpassed him, in the felicity of phrasing with which he clothed these children of his fancy. Aldrich was always brilliant. He couldn't help it. He is a fire opal set round with rose diamonds. When he is not speaking, you know that his dainty fancies are twinkling and glimmering around in him. When he speaks, the diamonds flash. Yes, he was always brilliant. He will always be brilliant. He will be brilliant in hell. You will see. Stevenson smiling a chuckly smile. I hope not. Well, you will, and he will dim even those ruddy fires, and look like a transfigured Adonis, backed against a pink sunset. There on that bench we struck out a new phrase, one or the other of us, I don't remember which, submerged renown. Variations were discussed, submerged fame, submerged reputation, and so on, and a choice was made. Submerged renown was elected, I believe. This important matter rose out of an incident which had been happening to Stevenson in Albany. While in a bookshop or bookstall there, he had noticed a long rank of small books, cheaply but neatly gotten up, and bearing such titles as Davis's Selected Speeches, Davis's Selected Poetry, Davis's This, and Davis's That, and Davis's The Other Thing. Compilations, every one of them, each with a brief, compact, intelligent, and useful introductory chapter by this same Davis, whose first name I have forgotten. Stevenson had begun the matter with this question. Can you name the American author whose fame and acceptance stretch widest in the States? I thought I could, but it did not seem to me that it would be modest to speak out in the circumstances, so I diffidently said nothing. Stevenson noticed, and said, Save your delicacy for another time. You are not the one. For a shilling you can't name the American author of widest note and popularity in the States, but I can. Then he went on and told about that Albany incident. He had inquired of the shopman, Who is this Davis? The answer was, An author whose books have to have freight trains to carry them, not baskets. Apparently you have not heard of him. Stevenson said no, this was the first time. The man said, "'Nobody has heard of Davis. You may ask all around, and you will see. You never see his name mentioned in print, not even in advertisement. These things are of no use to Davis, not any more than they are to the wind and the sea. You never see one of Davis's books floating on top of the United States. But put on your diving armor, and get yourself lowered away down and down and down till you strike the dense region, the sunless region of eternal drudgery and starvation wages. There you'll find them by the million. The man that gets that market, his fortune is made, his bread and butter are safe, for those people will never go back on him. An author may have a reputation which is confined to the surface, and lose it, and become pitied, then despised, then forgotten, entirely forgotten, the frequent steps in a surface reputation. A surface reputation, however great, is always mortal, and always killable, if you go at it right, with pins and needles and quiet slow poison, not with a club and tomahawk. But it is a different matter with the submerged reputation, down in the deep water. Once a favorite there, always a favorite. Once beloved, always beloved. Once respected, always respected, honored, and believed in. For what the reviewer says never finds its way down into those placid deeps, nor the newspaper sneers, nor any breath of the winds of slander blowing above. Down there they never hear of these things. Their idol may be painted clay up there at the surface, and fade and waste and crumble and blow away, there being much weather there. But down below he is gold and adamant and indestructible. Number 5. This is from this morning's paper. Mark Twain letter sold. Written to Thomas Nast, it proposed a joint tour. 
A Mark Twain autograph letter brought forty-three dollars yesterday at the auction by the Merwin Clayton Company of the Library and Correspondence of the late Thomas Nast, cartoonist. The letter is nine pages, note paper, is dated Hartford, November 12, 1877, and is addressed to Nast. It reads, in part, as follows. Hartford, November 12. My dear Nast, I did not think I should ever stand on a platform again until the time was come for me to say I die innocent. But the same old offers keep arriving that have arriven every year, and been every year declined. Five hundred dollars for Louisville, five hundred dollars for St. Louis, a thousand gold for two nights in Toronto, half gross proceeds for New York, Boston, Brooklyn, etc. I have declined them all, just as usual, though sorely tempted, as usual. Now I do not decline because I mind talking to an audience, but because, one, traveling alone is so heart-breakingly dreary, and two, shouldering the whole show is such cheer-killing responsibility. Therefore I now propose to you what you proposed to me in November 1867, ten years ago, when I was unknown, viz. that you should stand on the platform and make pictures, and I stand by you and blackguard the audience. I should enormously enjoy meandering around to big towns, don't want to go to little ones, with you for company. The letter includes a schedule of cities and the number of appearances planned for each. This is as it should be. This is worthy of all praise. I say it myself, lest other competent persons should forget to do it. It appears that four of my ancient letters were sold at auction, three of them at twenty-seven dollars, twenty-eight dollars, and twenty-nine dollars, respectively, and the one above mentioned at forty-three dollars. There is one very gratifying circumstance about this, to wit, that my literature has more than held its own as regards money value through this stretch of thirty-six years. I judge that the forty-three dollar letter must have gone at about ten cents a word, whereas, if I had written it to-day, its market rate would be thirty cents, so I have increased in value two or three hundred per cent. I note another gratifying circumstance, that a letter of General Grant sold at something short of eighteen dollars. I can't rise to General Grant's lofty place in the estimation of this nation, but it is a deep happiness to me to know that when it comes to epistolary literature, he can't sit in the front seat along with me. This reminds me, nine years ago, when we were living in Tedworth Square, London, a report was cabled to the American journals that I was dying. I was not the one. It was another Clemens, a cousin of mine, Dr. J. Ross Clemens, now of St. Louis, who was due to die, but presently escaped by some chicanery or other characteristic of the tribe of Clemens. The London representatives of the American papers began to flock in, with American cables in their hands, to inquire into my condition. There was nothing the matter with me, and each in his turn was astonished and disappointed to find me reading and smoking in my study and worth next to nothing as a text for transatlantic news. One of these men was a gentle and kindly and grave and sympathetic Irishman, who hid his sorrow the best he could, and tried to look glad, and told me that his paper, The Evening Sun, had cabled him that it was reported in New York that I was dead. What should he cable in reply? I said, Say the report is greatly exaggerated. He never smiled, but went solemnly away and sent the cable in those words. The remark hit the world pleasantly, and to this day it keeps turning up now and then in the newspapers when people have occasion to discount exaggerations. The next man was also an Irishman. He had his New York cablegram in his hand from the New York world, and he was so evidently trying to get around that cable with invented softnesses and palliations that my curiosity was aroused, and I wanted to see what it did really say. So when occasion offered, I slipped it out of his hand, and it said, If Mark Twain dying, send five hundred words. If dead, send a thousand. Now that old letter of mine sold yesterday for forty-three dollars. When I am dead, it will be worth eighty-six. Mark Twain. To be continued. End of chapter 2